Thank you for listening to Critical Thinking is Required. If you enjoyed this podcast, please visit criticalthinkingisrequired.com, a community for those on the perpetual journey towards truth. On the CTIR website, you will find links to our Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube pages, an archive of all the other various CTIR podcasts, the CTIR blog, where articles are updated weekly, and a variety of other resources. Thank you again for your support and for listening to this podcast. Now put your thinking cap on real tight and get ready to think critically. After all, it's required. Hello, and thank you for listening to Critical Thinking is Required. You're about to listen to Interview 27 with Stefan Kinsella, and today we're going to talk about um, intellectual property and the broad topic and about his book, uh, Against Intellectual Property. Uh, Mr. Kinsella is a registered patent attorney. He's the founder and executive editor of Libertarian Papers, among other things, and you can check out more about him at stefankinsella.com. And thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. Sure. Glad to be here. Okay, so uh, I normally ask this question to people I talk to, and I'm just wondering, uh, why specifically are you a libertarian? Like, how did you get there? What happened? What did you do to get there? So I was like in 10th or 11th grade in high school in Louisiana, and a teacher who knew I liked to read recommended The Fountainhead to me. So I started reading Ayn Rand, and that that just opened up uh, you know, her works and the works of others that she led me to like Henry Hazlitt and others, like in economic reasoning. And I think just a passion for justice and for individual rights and for consistency led me to finally just adopt um, the ideas uh, wholesale. And I eventually was led to Rothbard, Mises, and others. And uh, before a few years passed, I was... Um, okay. What, yeah, go ahead. It's always interesting how everybody always has that same beginning. <laughs> I started with uh, uh, Atlas Shrugged and then Henry Hazlitt, uh, Economics in One Lesson, and that's kind of what led me to where I am. But I've had friends that read Atlas Shrugged and are like, what is this? This is garbage. So it's like there's something before that too. <laughs> um, but I, also... I find that most people that have that view of Ayn Rand are, all, are usually already libertarians who came to it in a different way, and they yeah. have this sort of disdain for her thought. People that read it like first really like it, or they like something about it. Um, so it's it, it's interesting. Um, I mean, my view now actually is that I think Atlas Shrugged is still fantastic, but I, I actually think The Fountainhead, which is what got me started, I think The Fountainhead is actually pretty unlibertarian because it basically advocates intellectual property terrorism uh, and this kind of bizarre narcissism on the part of the, uh, the the main hero. So I think, I guess, the strongest characteristic is some kind of bizarre individualism, which makes some people uh, attracted to aspects of the libertarian idea. But I don't really think at, uh, The Fountainhead is that libertarian. Uh, Atlas Shrugged uh, is much more so, I think. Definitely. Okay, and I, there are some uh, people who may who listen to this who go to law school or recently graduated or maybe lawyers or something. And I'm wondering, do you have any advice to either young lawyers or students in law school or you know maybe just general advice or even advice when it comes to if they were thinking about uh, patent law or you know taking that big old test. I do. I I, um, I actually have a, a long blog post which I can send you the link to. Maybe you can include it in um, the That's show notes great. or something. Yeah, definitely. Um, I have a, a um, an older post. So it's called something like advice to anarchist libertarian law students or prospective law students because I've gotten questions like this many times over the years. And um, um, I and friends of mine have cobbled together. You know, it's not systematic, but just a variety of uh, 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 you know, comments and advice and things like that. Um, I guess my main advice would be a couple things. Uh, on the ethics front, I would say you, you just should not engage in a profession that is um, that you just can never square ethically, like. I just think you can't work for the Drug Enforcement Administration, you know, preventing people from doing drugs. You know, you can't work for the federal prosecutor, putting people in jail for victimless crimes. Um, other than that, there's a lot of legal professions that you can you can get involved in that can be good careers. And so I would say, among those careers, after you get rid of the ethical issues, you get past the ethical issues. Um, I think you have to focus on the career as a practical career and just you really – you're not always going to be able to integrate any ethical uh, – any libertarian considerations into it. 
In other words, I would just focus on your career and not try to be a libertarian. I would almost view being a libertarian as, as like someone who's a Methodist or who's a Pentecostal or who's a Catholic or, or a religious. You know, they go to church on the weekends. It's their <laughs> hobby or their side thing. Yeah. Um, I know it's important to people in their lives, but I've just seen it so many times ruin people's career aspirations because they keep asking, you know, who, who's a libertarian lawyer that I can hire or what kind of libertarian profession can I get involved in? And I, I do think that there are certain boundaries as an ethical human being that you shouldn't cross, okay? But I don't think that you want to be a libertarian attorney. You want to be an attorney that's good or whatever your profession is or your, or your career. Okay, so let's talk about your book, uh, Against Intellectual Property. I, you know, I was going to just talk to you about it, but then I, I decided, hey, it's short. So I read it yesterday. It t didn't take very long, and it, it was pretty good, and it, it kind of like it took everything and kind of made it easy to read in a really short, not very long book, which is easy for someone like me. And I'm just wondering, what's the main thesis of what you were writing there? So I wrote that book in 99, 2000 because I was a, a fairly fresh young patent attorney at the time and a libertarian and interested in libertarian, you know, political philosophy and rights theory and economic and legal theory. And I just saw a lot of confusion in this area and I, I, I just wanted to sort it out myself. So I did. And then I decided to write it up because there wasn't a lot out there in a clear way. Um, and by the way, uh, in the last, uh, I guess, 12, 13 14 years since it's been published, you know, I've written a lot of blog posts and other articles. So my, my plan right now is to publish a brand new work in a, probably about a year, um, just restating the whole thing from scratch. And the, the tentative title is copy this book. Um, and I, I think it'll be even more basic and present things from the ground up better than the original one did. Um, but the basic thesis is the same. The basic thesis is simply that the purpose of property rights is to help us uh, uh, avoid conflict in a world of scarce resources. That is, we all humans live together in a world of scarce resources, and property rules are simply designed to help us use these resources without violent conflict so that we have a rule that specifies who the owner of a resource is. And the particular rules libertarians settle on are the, the ones that we all know first person who uses it or the person who gets it by contract, etc. It's the, it's the legitimate owner. Everything else pretty much follows from that. Uh, the thesis of the IP work is, is that intellectual property laws are in conflict with property rights. That is, they undercut and invade property rights um, by the power of the state. Um, and there's a lot of harms that flow from this in the field of copyright and patent in particular, which are the two main types of intellectual property law. Um, so the idea is that intellectual property, in particular patent and copyright, are based upon a flawed understanding of the purpose, nature, and role of, of property rights, and that the state institutes them, and it basically amounts to a type of legalized theft or taking uh, it, it sets up monopoly privileges. It protects people from competition. It permits people to use the power of government courts to take other people's property, uh, to put it simply. So it's really just another example of the way that the state corrupts natural law by the power of legislation and allows property and wealth to be redistributed from one class to another. And that is actually what copyright and patent do. Copyright basically stifles free speech and corrupts the artistic culture. And patent system uh, reduces and stifles innovation and sets up artificial oligopolies or monopolies, um, such as in the case of the, uh, 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 of the smartphone companies, for example, like uh, Apple and Samsung and Google pretty much have a lock on this market because of patent. And small competitors are locked out of this of this battle, and the consumers pay the price for all these patent wars that go on. And in the face in in, in, the, in the field of, of copyright, um, we have uh, restrictions on what you can do with information that you've learned from from the culture, um, which results in the government seizing power over companies, seizing their assets, as in the case of um, mega 
the mega upload, the mega company, you know, down in New Zealand, um, putting people in jail, threatening to regulate the internet, which is the greatest tool of human freedom ever devised and ever known. So copyright and patent are two of the worst things that the state does, I believe, and there are complete corruptions of property rights, the free market, um, and natural natural law. People don't realize this because they fly under the banner of property rights. They're called intellectual property rights, which is just a propaganda term come, which was come up with by the advocates of patent and copyright because, you know, in the 1800s, all these free market economists were saying, what the hell's up with, with these patent and copyright laws? They're basically an infringement on individual rights and free market and property rights. So the defenders who were trying to rely upon these laws started saying, oh, no, it's, it's a type of property right. So they started calling them property rights just to, just, to, uh, just to defend these laws. But that's just complete propaganda. So my problem with patent and copyright is that they're completely unproprietarian, unfree market. Um, I would even argue they're unconstitutional, and we can get into that if you want to. Okay, so there's – my understanding, there were four different types of IP law that you talked about in your book, and it was trade secret, trademark, patent, and copyright. And I just want to talk about two of them real quickly. And what's a trade secret? What is that briefly? Well, so a trade secret is uh, some information or knowledge that is held by a given company or person, which is not widely known, and which gives them some kind of competitive advantage in the free market. Okay, that's and what a trade. That's what a trade secret is. Trade secret law is the doctrine that the government courts will step in and they will issue an injunction against a third party to prevent them from spreading information if it's not yet made public, which is the part of it that's unlibertarian, in my view. So, There's nothing wrong with keeping information secret, but the problem is that the government courts will enforce the trade secret right against. Even a third party, not merely a contractor or a, a former employee, but even against a third party. So I believe trade secret law is totally unlibertarian, although it doesn't do that much damage in practice. Okay, is it similar to civil theft? No, no, I don't think it is similar to civil theft. Trade secret just means you can keep information secret, which you don't really need a special law for. Anyone's entitled to keep information. Okay, secret. so no one's actually taking the property or the item. Uh, let, let's say it was the, the recipe for KFC, whatever, and it was locked somewhere. I mean, if someone just if someone shared it, that's different. Uh, but if someone actually took it out of there, that's what I'm wondering if it's civil theft. If, if you took well, the, 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 the typical example would be um, you have employees which have access to information owned by the company, okay? And they have an agreement with the company that they're they have to keep this information confidential even if they even after they quit like the recipe for KFC or Coca-Cola or whatever. Okay. So under standard contract and even fraud law, you could, you could have them liable if they violated their contract, which mm -hmm. was a, comp, a, a contract, an obligation of confidentiality. Trade secret law goes beyond that. In other words, you don't need trade secret law for that part. All you need is contract law. Right. Trade secret law lets the owner, the so-called owner of the confidential information, go to a court to seek an injunction not only against the, in, the former employee who is about to reveal the information he promised not to reveal, okay. but against other people that he's revealed it to it. who are third parties. Okay, so it's, it's kind of like Edward... Kind of it's kind of like Edward Snowden taking the information and, not, and then him giving it to uh, Greenwald, and then Greenwald would be punished. Yeah, kind of. That, that would be that. a better, better. That would be a better analogy. Um, yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay. So I get that. Okay. So let's go to trademark. And what is that? And what's the libertarian? Trademark. Theory? Trademark is a. Um, well, trademark is a right that are, are, did arise under common law, just like trade secret did. Unlike patent and copyright, by the way, which which were totally statutory and and did not arise under common law. Uh, trade trademark is just the right um, associated with. Um, the source or the identifier of the source of goods, okay? So it has to do with the source of goods. So Coca-Cola is another example. The Coca-Cola company sells a, a can of soda called Coca-Cola that tells consumers that this is from this producer or this supplier. Um, trademark rights are basically a right of the 
original user of the trademark to prevent other competitors from using a similar mark that might confuse consumers. And therefore, a lot of libertarians think that trademark, even if copyright and patent are problems, they think trademark is sort of rooted in the idea of fraud, like mm -hmm. you're trying to deceive or defraud consumers, and therefore it's somewhat legitimate, which was a little bit my original view, which I did hint at in, in the, the A Against IP article. Um, but I've, I've, I've since come to even reject trademark rights uh, for similar reasons that I reject trade secret. Um, you basically don't need... If trademark is rooted in the idea of fraud, all you need is fraud law and contract law. Okay. So if someone commits an act of fraud or someone commits an act of contract breach, then fraud law and contract law will handle those situations. Trademark law necessarily adds something else on top of it, which is on libertarian. Trademark law basically says that, um, number one, well, there's, there's at least three problems with trademark law. The first one is that the plaintiff, the person who has the right of action, is not the defrauded consumer. It's the company that uses the trademark. Okay, and second, you don't have to prove there was any actual victim who actually was defrauded. So, for example, you'll see trademark law being used in anti-competitive ways by, say, the makers of watches or purses or fashion goods who will have things seized, which are so-called knockoffs, okay, of these goods, even though the people buying them know that they're knockoffs. So if you buy a $20 Rolex watch at the dock, you know, in Turkey, you're not really being defrauded because you mm -hmm. know very well that it's a fake Rolex. So there's no fraud, actually, in this case, and yet Rolex can get an, 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 a court order or a police action against the manufacturer of these knockoff Rolex watches, even though there's no consumer fraud. So libertarians who claim that Trademark is based upon fraud uh, are just wrong. They don't really don't know what they're talking about, or they don't understand trademark law. Okay, so it'd only be for the consumer who's actually defrauded. So, yeah, so I think a legitimate action in a, in a free society would be the consumer who's defrauded, maybe even a class action, maybe even a number of consumers. Okay, I'm not even ruling that out. But they would have to, they would have to sue saying that they were defrauded by some vendor who is selling them goods that were not what was represented. But the, the thing about this is, this is going to be such a small problem in a free society because you have one of two cases. Either you're a legitimate business starting up and you're going to get a lot of investors and a lot of investment, right? And in such a case, you're not going to have people that give you money to start a business which is a knockoff of McDonald's or Coca-Cola because you're going to get sued by a bunch of class actions from defrauded consumers, or you're going to start a new business, right, which is not the same one. Um, so it's just really a non-problem in a free society. Fraud on such a scale would be a very small problem, um, um, and therefore the whole trademark thing is a red herring. So I believe trademark and trade secret are both illegitimate types of IP, and by the way, there are others other than the four you mentioned, but they're, they're fairly recent. There's a uh, uh, there's database rights in some countries. There's so-called so moral rights in some countries, and there are um, uh, semiconductor mask work protection rights in the U.S. Like it's, it's the way that a semiconductor design is configured. Um, so you have all these new kind of IP rights all the time. In fact, you even have like the NSA and these special federal regulations which prevent people from using federal seals and things on their websites. It's like a quasi IP, but the, the the big four are trademark, trade secret, copyright, and patent. Okay, and then I I was doing some research, and there's something called the Patent and Trademark Office, and I'm just wondering yeah, the, patent, the PTO, Patent and Trademark Office. That's okay, right. so the, the federal, trademark federal agency. And when you make a trademark or you do a patent and you go through the legal system, you like send something to them, and I'm just wondering. And then they they actually approve it, because I, I know there's a th Supreme Court case coming soon, and, and they would actually like approve it or, you know, put a stamp on it and say this is okay? Well, sort of. Um, uh, I actually am, I have never quite understood why the, well, uh, trade secrets is primarily a state, a state thing, although there are federal aspects to it, but trademark, trade, uh, copyright and patents are handled on the federal level by 
by two different federal agencies. The Patent and Trademark Office, the PTO, handles trademark and patent, and the Copyright Office handles copyrights. Hmm. Um, I don't really understand why they're divided that way. I believe that the More Copyright Office is under the, it's under the Library of Congress. Um, the Trademark Act is actually unconstitutional, I believe, because there's no authorization for federal trademarks in the Constitution. Um, but for some reason, the uh, the trademark law and the patent law are handled by one agency, and the copyright law is handled by another agency. Ever since the early 80s, and since the U.S. acceded to the Berne Convention, which is a copyright treaty which we pushed on other countries, uh, copyright is automatic, so you don't have to apply for copyright. Oh, you have the copyright automatically in an original work of creative expression as soon as you fix it in a tangible medium, which means as soon as you write something down, as soon as you write it on a piece of paper, as soon as you email someone something, you have a copyright in that creative content automatically. You don't have to put a copyright notice on it. You don't have to register it. Those are just formalities which are not necessary. Uh, in the trademark field, you have state trademark rights automatically as soon as you start using a mark in commerce to sell a product. But you can get a federal trademark registration by filing the registration. So that is an application. You do, you do need to apply for it to get the federal mark, although even if you don't apply, you still have state trademark rights. Now, patents are a different field. Those are basically all or nothing. You have to apply to get a patent, and if you don't apply, then you don't get a patent. And, and there are no patent rights. And in fact, once the idea becomes publicly known, no one else theoretically can get a patent on it either. So the uh, patent system is an application system. You have to apply for it. Okay, for the patent system, are they elected or is it just some random people? So the patent system has a commissioner, which is appointed by the president. So that's a political office, but it's basically a bunch of bureaucrats in Crystal City, Virginia, and Washington, D.C., which uh, is sort of like the post office. It, it, it can, it can, um, it can uh, collect its own fees. And it's pretty much, as far as I understand it, not only is it self-sustaining, I think they actually make a profit, but of course the federal government passes that off every year. <laughs> so they make a profit, in a sense, by charging filing fees for the patent applications and other things. And um, they use that to pay their these bureaucrats now the bu and, 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 and technical specialists. So they hire a lot of engineers who are just patent examiners. So there's like a huge core of tens of thousands of these people divided by technical specialty, computer science, biological sciences, material science, mechanical, um, hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of specialties. And when you submit a patent application to the patent office, some, 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 some first office reviews it and decides which group to send it to. And then they send it to that group, and that group now has ownership of it, and they have to, they have to assign an examiner to examine it. So that's how that process works. Okay, and since we're talking kind of on patents, I'm just wondering, um, just generally, like, if, if we got rid of patent laws, um, wouldn't we have less research? Uh, I, was, I was wondering, like, let, let's say Ebola, and let's say there were companies that were trying to come up with a vaccine. Um, why would they invest in creating that vaccine if someone else could just take that product, um, look at the ingredient, you know, basically take the same ingredients and all that stuff, and then just build it themselves and then sell it? So I think you have to look at the different arguments for patents and for, and for copyright in general. But the, the, the original, there's a clause in the Constitution in Article 1, Section 8, which says that the Congress has the power to protect the works of basically scientists and artists okay, for limited periods of time, which is the original authorization for patent copyright law, which, by the way, is why this, the, the federal trademark law, I believe, is unconstitutional because there's nothing about trademarks in there. But in any case... The, the purpose, as enumerated in the Constitution, is to uh, promote the promote the progress of science and the arts. So it's a utilitarian purpose, sort of along the lines that you're alluding to. That's not the only argument adduced in favor of these laws by their proponents, by libertarians and others, who think there's sort of a natural right to these things that you create because you created them. Like if you create a new useful idea, that you own this idea. Okay, but most people argue for patent and copyright law uh, on utilitarian grounds. So what they say is that um, without patent law, without some kind of artificial government pr uh, protection of 
of, of, a, of a producer of ideas from competition that they would be facing competition too easily or too early and they would have a reduced incentive to come up with these ideas in the first place, like pharmaceuticals or software or whatever. Okay, so the idea is that if the government gives you a temporary monopoly on this invention, then you know you're protected from competition for 17 years or something like that. Okay, so now I, I know I'm protected from competition, so I have a, a, an increased incentive to engage in research and development because I can recoup my cost because I can sell these products at a higher price, which we normally call an economic a monopoly price, and I can make a higher profit. And uh, but so the whole idea there, first of all, empirically, this has never been proven. This is the assumption of the utilitarian or empirical argument for IP for patent, and it has never been proven in the history of IP law. It's always argued like this, but the data has never demonstrated this. Um, the patent clause was put in the Constitution in 1789 before we had a lot of data. It was basically uh, to revive the remnant of the statute of monopolies from England in uh, 1623. So they just did it because they were used to that system um, in England. They didn't have a lot of data. And in the 200-plus years since then, there's never been any data to verify the claim that it does increase innovation. Um, in fact, the data shows the other one. It shows the opposite. It shows that the patent system reduces innovation, it reduces competition, it distorts the economy, it distorts the structure of research and development and scientific discovery. Um, and not only that, even if it did increase innovation, it would have to come at the cost of something else. It's like any government program. You know, the argument that the patent system encourages or increases innovation is sort of like the idea that NASA is a good program because we have spin-off technology, you know, like we have Tang, you know. They had to develop Tang as some kind of drink that the astronauts could drink. So we're better off because we have Tang. Well, we may be, we may not be. I don't know. I'm not a big Tang fan, but... The point is, we spent billions and hundreds of billions of dollars to develop Tang, and that was had to be at the expense of something else that was not developed, or some other use of the funds that could have been, um, that people could have used the, mo the money for. So nothing is costless. Um, there is no doubt that the patent system distorts the economy. No one, no one can seriously with a straight face deny this, which means that. Some things are engaged in more frequently than otherwise, and other things are discouraged. Um, so, for example, you cannot get a patent on basic mathematical algorithms or scientific uh, physical proofs of the you know, uh, phys laws of physics, like E equals MC squared, cannot be patented. Applications of these things can be. So what this means is that companies will devote more resources to things that can be patented and others that won't, to things that won't, less than less the things that can't be patented. So this does distort the economy. It distorts the structure of research and development, which implies that if we were to end the patent system, things would change. There's no doubt about that. Some things would be probably more invested in, and other things would be less invested in. But that just means we're returning back to a natural level that we would have in a free market absent government intervention. Okay, now just to transition, I always had this idea of coming up with this company where I would dress up like uh, like Curious George or Mickey Mouse. I have a, a four year old daughter, so I'm always thinking there's no businesses like this around here, and I'm sure there's a reason. And going to like birthday parties and having fun and you know making money that right. way. And I'm just right. wondering, what am I violating there? Patent law or copyright law? It's not patent law for sure. It's probably copyright or maybe trademark law. And in fact, in fact, this happens. I can give you hundreds of examples of things like this. Um, there are uh, restaurants which do not have the waiters saying happy birthday, you know, the, the classic song, happy birthday to you, um, to patrons when they have a birthday because they've been warned that they have to pay royalties to the owners of the copyright to the happy birthday song, so they make up a new song instead. Okay, same thing in movies or doc documentaries. Uh, and there are companies that make cakes for birthday parties, and they cannot put Mickey Mouse on there because they're going to be sued by Disney, et cetera, under copyright or trademark law. Um, 
so what they do is they either make up something that's like Mickey Mouse, so it's kind of not quite as good. It's always kind of a ripoff. Or people tend to go to these fly-by-night, you know, little Vietnamese bakeries down the corner where the owners don't give a, give a damn about copyright law. So it's not, like, legitimate. You have to go to the gray market or kind of go underground to get what you really want. So there's a, there's innumerable examples of this. Um, um, have you ever have you ever seen uh, 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 Nathan for you that show on Comedy Central? I, no, I, I've heard about it. I okay, it. there's the one he did where he he because I guess there's an exception because there's always exceptions to laws where if you a parody is protected <laughs> and he did the parody yeah. of Starbucks and it was like I forget what it was like stupid bucks or something like that and. <laughs> Yeah, I saw that. I saw that. Uh, I saw that. Uh, that whole stunt, and uh, you know, the the law does recognize some exceptions to copyright uh, infringement, which is called the fair use doctrine. And one of the uh, the the, uh, the articulated uh, developments of that is called the uh, parody exception. But it's not really clear cut. And the point is, it's not like it's not like there's a, a statute saying you can do A, B, and C. Mm-hmm. So. You could have a lawyer or a friend of yours who knows the law who can tell you, I think you're pretty much covered. But that doesn't mean that the owner of the copyright can't sue you anyway. And if they have millions of dollars and you don't have any, then you're still you're still screwed. And there is a, a similar parody exception for trademark. Um, so there are some exceptions that governments have carved out. It, in a way, this is good. In a way, it's bad. It's good, of course, because anytime you reduce the extent of a law, it's a good thing. You know, if you reduce the income tax from 34 to 32 percent, that's a good thing. It's not ideal, but it's good. If you reduce the extent of trademark and copyright law by carving out an exception, that's a good thing. But the, the bad part of it is that this is what the government does. They impose these arbitrary laws, which are for the benefit of special interests, which harm the average consumer in mostly invisible ways. And then when there's an especially visible or egregious application of these laws, the government will back up and they'll make an exception for that. So when you confront a proponent of IP law, even libertarians, and you say, well, don't you think it's wrong that um, I can't whistle a tune in my bathroom that I heard on a movie yesterday? And then, so then they'll have the convenient excuse, well, there's a fair use exception for that. So they, 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 they keep coming up with these exceptions which, which sort of smooth over the rough edges of the application of law to everyday people so that they don't have to confront the reality of what these laws would mean if they were applied consistently. I mean, most of us who believe in property rights believe that if you own a piece of property, you really own it. You own it forever unless you get rid of it voluntarily, and you have the right to prevent people from using it at all. It's basically an absolute doctrine. And there can be hard applications of that, but we believe that. And it's only but tangible it, property, right? Well, yeah, I'm just saying in regular property law applied to tangible material objects. We, we all have this belief that it, 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 it doesn't end at a certain arbitrary time. Like it's not just a 50-year right or a 20-year mm-hmm. right or a 100-year right. It's, your, it's yours forever. And other people just can't use it without your permission. But in the field of IP law, if they were to apply patent and copyright law in the same way, which some advocates of patent law and copyright law are in favor of, actually, they believe that patent and copyright should be perpetual and should be extended to cover things that it, that it doesn't cover now. For example, um, um, fashion designs are not covered by patent or copyright right now, and perfume smells are not covered by copyright now, and Food recipes and bartender drink recipes are not covered by any of these IP rights. And there's a whole lobby out there trying to extend the field of IP protection to these things. Um, some people want there to be copyrights in newspaper headlines. In fact, I think this was recently passed in Germany. Um, so, you know, uh, th- there's always a desire to extend the scope of IP law and to extend it, it, its penalty and to extend its is duration. If you were to make patent and copyright law last forever, like regular property rights last, then we would be stifled as a, as a society and as an economy. You couldn't do anything. You couldn't cook food. You couldn't use fire. You couldn't read. You couldn't use the alphabet. You couldn't communicate. I mean, there's so many things you couldn't do because you would have to get permission 
from hundreds or thousands of people scattered around the world, which are the who are the descendants of the original creators of the alphabet or fire or this technique or that technique, it would stifle the world. We would basically die. I mean, literally, I think we would die as a species if, if intellectual property rights were enforced um, as a real type of right, like real property rights are. And therefore, the proponents of these rights back off. It's just like the people who advocate a minimum wage. You know, they'll say, well, we need to raise the minimum wage from 7 bucks an hour to, to $13 an hour. And so what do we libertarians say? We say, well, why don't you raise it to 100 bucks an hour mm-hmm. or a million dollars an hour because everyone will be better off with 100 bucks an hour or a million dollars an hour. And the proponents, they always back off and they say, well, we don't want to go too far. They sense, they know that if they proposed or if they got into place a, a, min, a minimum wage for $100 an hour, the economy would grind to a halt and we'd have massive unemployment. Everyone would starve and die. So they just push little incremental changes to help the people that benefit from these laws, like Walmart and other companies that pretend like they're harmed by, you know, uh, by, by a minimum wage law, but who are actually benefited because they're already paying minimum wage. And so these laws only hurt their competitors, not them. Same yeah. thing with patent and copyright law is that these laws are never pushed for um, to be enforced just like regular property rights, but they're defended as if they're regular property rights, and they're not. Now, one solution, like let's say we took – do you have a few more minutes? Sure. Okay. So one solution, like let's say we got government out of the way completely. It would be contract law? Or you'd have some well, sort of contract would determine um, whether someone has a right to intangible property or something. So the way I view it is, well, first of all, I think property property law is the fundamental thing. That is the the, the allocation of the right to control resources that people can have a conflict over, which are scarce resources, material things in the real world, things that we use as means in the real world to accomplish things. Contract law is just a consequence of that. Contract is just the is just the exercise by an owner of a piece of property as to who gets to use it. And that, that exercise can be expressed orally, uh, sorry, verbally, uh, or I mean orally or written in a written in a written fashion, or it can be exercised um, and it can be exercised um, in a complete fashion or in a partial fashion. So I can give you a temporary or a complete or a perpetual right to something. I can sell you something, or I can temporarily rent it to you, or I can give you a partial right or a complete right. That is, you can use it for whatever purpose you want. You can even destroy it, or you can only rent my Avis rental car and use it to drive around town, and you can't destroy it, you can't sell it, etc. So you can do whatever you want as the owner of a resource because you're the owner. So contract is just the expression of will of the owner. So contract, in my opinion, is derivative on the fundamental notion of property rights. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to what actions you're permitted to do in a free society, are you permitted to use this information? I think that basically is a question either of, of property rights, which boils down to criminal law or tort law or trespass law, or it's a question of contract. Like, did you actually agree not to perform this this action, and if you did agree to it, what penalties did you agree to pay if you violate this this restriction? So I think yes, it would it would basically come down to contract law. Um, I think it's completely uh, absurd and unrealistic to imagine that it would be a widespread practice for people to agree to pay millions of dollars in penalties if they use information that they've learned on the free market, like if you read a book and you learn something from it, or if you observe a competitor making a product and you want to compete with them by making something similar or even identical, I, it, it's, it's almost impossible to imagine anyone would agree not to do this or, or that they would agree to pay uh, you know, uh, uh, absurd fines if they did that. But that would be the only way you could make such a system work in a free market by contract. Well, it's just it, that the idea is that it's infeasible. I'm I'm always surprised. I forget what they're called, but uh, anti-competitor 
uh, clauses. I don't know what the name is. It's, it's escaping me. Not, but something not not non compete. Yeah, there you go. And I'm wondering, like, because people actually sign that, which is kind of crazy. That the idea that you can't work for a business for three years or something, uh, or you can't work for a similar business or maybe a competitor or something. Uh, so it, it's they do. conceivable. They do. They- they, th- those types of things are conceivable, but if you understand the way those are written, those are very limited in scope. Usually they're about one or two years at most, and most states won't enforce them past one year anyway. Most states won't enforce them uh, at all. And all it says is that I'm giving you training and information in a particular case, and you have to agree not to go use this information to hurt me within a certain time frame. Sometimes people find that in their interest to sign. Sometimes they don't. But the point is, even those contracts only bind the, the one person who signed it, that is yeah. the employee. Okay? Patent and copyright are, are what we call in the law in rem rights. They're rights against the world. They're rights yeah. against property. They're rights to property. They bind people that have never signed a contract. So the, the idea that you could use a contract model to come up with something like intellectual property is – ridiculous um it's literally impossible uh you you just cannot bind third parties by a contract between a and b it might bind a and it might bind b and even that i'm skeptical of because of libertarian ideas about inalienability and other things and the theory of contract but even if you could bind those parties it would only bind them it would not bind third parties and you have to bind third parties to make any IP system work mm-hmm. at all. That's a great point I didn't think about. Okay, so I have one final question, and it's a, sure. kind of a nerd question. So let's pretend uh, we're 30, 50 years down in the future, and okay, I imagine it being like a video game. There was a book, uh, Ready Player One, that I read that was excellent, that I, I kind of view the future like this. And everyone has these pods in their houses, and they go online in this massive online gaming world. And I'm just wondering, and this is more of a property question, I suppose, and if... If um, in the game I created something and it was a sword, okay, <laughs> it's kind of nerdy, or maybe I, I created something inside of it and there was only that one item, um, do I have uh, – is that my property? Well, a, a similar question has come up for me with regard to Bitcoin and whether Bitcoin should be considered property. Um, um so my view is no, and um, although I don't think it matters, I, even if it is, if the answer is yes, it still doesn't change the IP uh, analysis. My, my answer is no for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, the rules of the game are specified by, the, by either an implicit or a written contract between the people that are participating in this scheme, this game. Right. So it's like if you enter someone's bar – and they have a rule about whether you can have guns or not, or, or, or whatever. Everyone there is there on the owner's permission, and they've agreed to certain rules. So the, the first answer would be, let's look at the contract that everyone who's participating in this, in this game agreed to, and see what it says. And even then, if it's, it still wouldn't be a property right, because it's only a property, it's only a right as among the people that have agreed to it. And then I just think – I'm not a big gamer, but I think the the hypothetical is a little bit ridiculous because you say there's only one and you, they created it. Well, you didn't really create an it. You didn't create a thing ontologically. All you did was arrange pixels on a computer screen according to the, the rules of some program. And I don't understand why there's only one. I mean it could be copied infinitely, easily if the rules of the game permitted it. Okay. Right? Yeah. So it's, 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 if it's scarce, it's artificially scarce, and it's only artificially scarce by the rules of the game of the itself, game. which everyone's participating had to agree to. Um, I think a similar analysis can be applied to Bitcoin, although I'm not quite sure about this yet. Um, I don't think Bitcoins are property. In fact, I think the word property is another thing that you would have to look into in detail. The word property ought to be used upon careful reflection as a relationship between a human actor, an agent, an owner, and a particular resource, or really between the owner and other people in the world regarding a resource. So 
to call the thing that's the subject of a property right, to call it property is to confuse the issue. Agree. Yeah. If you want to be technical, I would not call, right, let's say I own a watch. I don't think the watch is property, technically speaking. The watch is a resource. I have a property right in the watch. Right? So mm -hmm. the question is not, is the watch property? The question is only this. When we identify a resource that can only be used by one person at a time, there can be conflict over that resource. Okay? So then the question is, who gets to use it? Okay, so what's the property right that we favor? And libertarians say that, well, we're certain, there are certain rules that specify who's the proper owner of that resource. But the question is not whether the watch is property. The question is, who has the property right to control this resource, this watch? And so when people that advocate intellectual property, they start to substitute the word property for the thing itself, they they load the question because they'll say, is an idea property? Well, the question isn't whether an idea is property. The question is, when we identify a scarce resource, who's the owner? Who has the property right in it? And an idea is just information that we use to guide our actions. An idea is not the resource that we can have conflict over. You and I can both use the pattern of information to make a watch using the resources that we have under our disposal. We might have a conflict over who gets to use this piece of gold or this piece of metal or this piece of glass or this, you know, this foundry. We could have conflict over that, and property rules are designed to determine the owners in those cases. But we cannot even theoretically have a property – have a conflict over the use of ideas or information or knowledge. Ideas and knowledge guide our actions. Our actions employ scarce resources. There are two different things. Property rights apply only to the second one. I completely agree. Right, well, thank you, Stefan, for uh, taking the time to talk to me. I greatly appreciate it. I enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen to this podcast. You are among the very few that listen to the whole thing. It's a rare occurrence, like seeing a unicorn or finding a politician that doesn't lie. If you enjoyed this episode, please take the time to share it with your friends and family, or at least give it an honest review on iTunes, Stitcher, or whatever medium you use to listen to this podcast. Finally, make sure you check out criticalthinkingisrequired.com to see everything CTR has to offer. Thank you again for your time and support, and as always, think critically.